I would like uh, to thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting me. I must admit that when I saw the program and uh, the contents of uh, today's sessions, I felt uh, I'm an odd fish here. Uh, I hope, though, after listening to uh, the two uh, previous presentations, that there are actually many more and stronger connections uh, between what has been said before and what I'm going to talk about than I first thought. So I hope that you will have the same feeling after my presentation. Uh, I would uh, like also to mention that this is actually not my main area of research. Uh, I belong to a department called Department for Sustainable Development, Environmental Science and Technology at KKH, newly formed since two years. And uh, this department and our division, Industrial Ecology, we are very much focused on how should we survive on the planet uh, over the next century uh, sustainably. And that is, uh, of course, it's a really difficult task, almost impossible to uh, research. But we are trying. And industrial ecology tries to understand, actually, the metabolism of society and the physical resource metabolism. So we try to understand how is energy flowing around, both from where we extract it or pick it, how we use it and where it ends up and materials, all kinds of materials. So it's like looking at the entire planet and the human society like a big organism. It's some kind of a Gaia, so to say, research. And this gives you uh, an insight into different magnitudes of things that are going on that are very interesting, but still, still very little known. So you could say that you have to be, at the moment, a very big, Optimist, if you look at the numbers that we reveal and you see where we are working uh, with different types of activities on Earth today. But uh, I am an optimist, very much, and that's part of why I'm here uh, today. And industrial ecology has helped me to come through to this with fish, because in Swedish I could say that I hear all of that we are talking klimat, klimat, klimat but we should talk about not, not, not. <laughs> and this, is, this has come as uh, just a feeling, a very strong feeling in the last few years when you see how the global food supply system how it works and also how close we are to different types of boundaries yep. and really fulfilling what our, our basic needs are. <laughs> It is also so that the food system is the one that is most easy, as I see, the most Nearest for us to create what all politicians talk about today, the circular economy, the eco-cycle economy. But when you listen to what people put into that expression, it is still very little of a circular economy in my personal opinion. But the food system, because it's so close to the natural systems, that should be, in my opinion, the first one we should try with. And that's why I'm so interested in fish and also in fish combined with other types of cultivations for the circulation of nutrients. My presentation today will cover a few areas. First, wild fish versus cultivated fish. Secondly, about the challenge of high intensity cultivation. What do we need to solve the basic problems when we try to cultivate fish in closed systems? And then a project we have been running for a few years, the so-called Nærfisk project, and that is fish produced close to consumers. And then a new initiative that we have been working to, uh, several of us here, and also myself together a lot with Anders Kisling, the next speaker, on the Urban Food Initiative. I will discuss a little bit what I would like to call more or less the dilemma of the economy of scale principle, and also a little bit about some future challenges. If we look first on wild fish versus cultivated fish, I put together a little bit of a table here where we can see I found figures from Lake Werner in Sweden. That we, let me just see if this is coming here. And we say the catch here. The harvest we can get from Lake Vernon in 2011 calculate as kilogram of fish per square meter per year. 
And then we go through a Swedish eutrophicated lake that is much, much higher. You go to uh, something I found on uh, Lake Boralis, which is the delta of the Nile River, how it was before eutrophication, when it was much higher than uh, an eutrophicated Swedish lake, going then when it was eutrophicated, how it come up very high uh, uh, in uh, productivity, and then the plant that we are now operating a so-called recirculating aquaculture system where we are up to 25 kilograms per square meter a year. So what we can say here, we can increase the productivity many thousand times, up to a million times versus uh, natural systems. And this is what we, so to say, are interested in as technologists and biologists at the, the moment. If we now see that maybe world population will not uh, level off with uh, less than 11 or perhaps 12 billion. And of these, we know that this urban population will double in 35 years from now. So the challenge, as I see it, is absolutely enormous. <laughs> the challenge is here. They are also very great because when you intensify the natural systems to the degree we're talking about here, several thousand times, you need actually to, to do a number of things in a more efficient way than nature is doing now. And that's actually where we as technologists, where we can contribute. And then we also create some things that we really don't know exactly that comes into value-based things like the ethics, for example, of cultivation and the ethics of running the, the, the show in the way we do. But this uh, figure, it shows a little bit about uh, the, the plant in... Uh, we shall not go there, we can take it here. Uh, there are fi six fish tanks in this uh, pilot plant. You could say it's a full-scale pilot plant. In total, six tanks of 10 cubic meters each. You have a drum filter that you take uh, away a few things. You have a biofilter. You have uh, then an aeration unit, a so-called trickle bed. And then you have also abilities to uh, add extra oxygen. And if we now try to look at what we need to do here in order to control it, we have to add oxygen all the time because the fish, they use up the oxygen much faster than natural oxygenation can take place. And that we do in the trickle bed, and we can also add additional oxygen from the outside. And then also we need to remove the carbon dioxide from the water, because if it gets too high levels of carbon dioxide, that would influence negatively on the fish. And then we also need to oxidize ammonia that is released from the degradation of proteins, and that is mainly done in the biofilter, and it also comes in the trickle bed. We can see that nitrite can also be uh, formed here that is very toxic, so we have to uh, remove that and keep it at very low levels, uh, typically below a fraction of a milligram per liter. And that is typically done also in the biological uh, parts of the system. We also need to remove the solid particles, that is mainly done in this drum filter, there can be other mechanisms as well. And then a final thing is that the nitrate that is being formed and accumulates in the system when we recirculate. That actually regulates how much we can keep the water in circulation. And typically you can recirculate the water between 99 and 100%, but you need to add a little bit of water per day and remove a little bit. There, is all, there are technical possibilities <coughs> also to uh, remove the nitrate, but then it becomes more costly and more also perhaps not uh, really as sustainable as you want. So that's a little bit about state of the art of this technology at this moment. So what we can say here that this recirculating aquaculture system, it may be regarded as an altered by a natural biological system where several processes and natural process, we have been speeding them up to save space and to get this very high harvest per unit area that we want. And then the question is, of course, can this intensification be regarded as sustainable? And that's one of, of these things that we really need to discuss. And I'm not saying that we have the answer. We know that we can get the fish in, in this way now at the moment. Then a little bit about the NAR fish project. And it started actually with a number of very small projects funded by the uh, Stockholm County Environmental Fund. 
And uh, here, HFSS, it stands for Holbar Fisk Försörjning i Stockholms län. So we got three consecutive projects between 2008 and 2012. After that, we had also a project funded by FORMAS, a Swedish uh, scientific uh, funding organization. And we knew in 2010 and 2013 about fish welfare. And then we studied how aquaculture actually is being operated in Sweden uh, today. And it was not a very positive situation. You could see that most people in Sweden working with fish aquaculture today, they work to stock lakes for sports fishing. They are very old, typically about above 50 years of age. And they more or less say that they lose money on their activity because they do it because they like it, but not, not because they earn money. So that was a little bit of a sad story. And that is, of course, what we would like to be part of, to change a bit. Uh, the NARFISC testbed technology, that was uh, the, so far the biggest project that we got funded from uh, Vinova. I will talk a little bit more about that. And NARFISC 14 and continued work, that is what we have been doing the last two years, uh, very much with involvement from uh, Swedish Agriculture University and Anders Kistling and also KTH and the company EcoLoop. And we have a couple here of just so to explanations, yeah. Uh, NARFISC, the testbed technology. This project, it was supported by Vinova 2012 to 2015. We got a contribution of 4.1 million for a total budget of 10.6 million. And uh, then the company, Svensk Fisk Oling, they also participated with a substantial contribution. The partners were Ecoloop, that is a small consultant company that works with uh, sustainable development as their main uh, business. KTH, Chalmers, uh, Svensk Fiskoling AB, Valenius Water and Nordic Water. The Nordic Water and Valenius Water are two big Swedish uh, equipment companies. Uh, what we were aiming at was to uh, build up and further be, build up Swedish com competence in the Ross area. And also, we established the test bed in uh, Justerö. That's an island right outside Stockholm here. And the Nerfisk, we were able, that this plant is still in operation. At the moment, there is no external funding, so that it is actually operated on, you could say, a hobby basis, more or less, by uh, the company Svensk Fiskoling AB, because it's a very small one. I will come back to this later and the challenges. The increased competence that we learned from them. We had also very interesting things that people that were participating here, they were in several cases from Swedish uh, companies working in the water treatment area. And they did not had not before been talking too much to each other, but we were able to bring them together in this new area of application of their equipment. What we could see here, that is that this advanced oxygen technology that is uh, provided by uh, the uh, Valenius Water Company, that it has a marked influence on the bacterial composition and the bacterial stability and also on the turbidity of the water of this recirculating aquaculture system. Perhaps the most interesting part was that we could uh, find it more or less totally new application of the sand, dynamic sand filtration system where we could keep the nitrite level at exceedingly low level, below 0 0.1 milligram per liter. So very efficient for this uh, oxidation of nitrite, which is a very good function for uh, um, ROS systems. And then we were also able to build something, this, uh, the social connections between the partners and the participating persons in this project. The last that we have ongoing, that is a pre-project with Vinova that was uh, run between 2014 and reported a few months ago, Nerfisk 14, where we would like to further develop this. Uh, we are now that we can say that in several years in this raw system, and this is for pike perch, which is a new fish to cultivate in raw systems in Sweden. Mm -hmm. It has worked and it produces about five tons of pike perch per year. So it's harvested and sold. Uh, but we have not yet been able to work very much with the market aspects. And fish, if you work with that, you also need to get uh, the fish uh, to the market. 
And it's very interesting that fish has something that, that is that sometimes it, you have a good price and sometimes you don't have any price at all. And if you're not secure, then a, a very, very big investment can get bankruptcy in a very, very short time. So to work with the market, who should buy the fish? Because we don't buy the fish if it's highly priced. That's the very interesting thing, that people buy fish and buy typically for very low prices. And as we will see later, this is a, a key aspect, how much we as individual consumers or how hospitals or schools and so on, how much they actually would like to pay for a high quality fish in several aspects of quality. So then I will go and mention a few words about the Urban Food Initiative that we started actually, it was about 15 months ago at the initiative here of Anders Kisling. That was, uh, at that time we were represented this um, uh, Swedish surplus energy collaboration and that had a project with Vinova and then he contacted me and we discussed and found out we should try to merge the SSEC and the NERFIS concept. And we worked hard last fall and we the, provided for Vinova a, a suggested national uh, research strategic agenda for urban food. Here we can see partners that were uh, declared their interest in this. We had in total about 50 different actors. We did not get the financing for a strategic national program. No, uh, not even the traditional Swedish food industry got uh, their uh, proposal funded. Uh, and there were some reasons here that are very interesting when you come up with rather radical suggestions. So we know that we are very well recognized, but there are also people, and that's very interesting to say, is food really something that is interesting for Sweden? Shouldn't we work with computers and telecommunication and, and self-driving cars and so on? And I think to me that is very, very interesting. It's challenging. But it lies a little bit in the where, times we work in. The basic pillars that we have here in the Urban Food uh, Initiative, that is first food security. I've been thinking philosophically about this recently. What is the difference if I go down to once or twice a week to the store and buy frozen fish or some a fresh fish? Or if I at home have a stock of 200 kilograms of fish that I feed myself? What is the difference in food safety? We are so used to that we can always go down to the store and buy our food. But we know from, the, from studies in Swedish municipalities that we have food for three or four days if the system stops to work the way we are used to it works. I think we should think a little bit more about this. Uh, high food quality, that is really high on the agenda, I would say, everywhere in society. We are asking for, uh, what is say, produced uh, nearby local food, but high quality and so on. More and more. We should ask even more for that. Acceptable environmental performance. Here there is always a trade-off. And I think it's very interesting to see there was a an, an meeting with the Swedish um, Jordbruksverket a couple of weeks ago. And there one of the big Swedish producers asked, what is sustainable fish aquaculture? And you know what the answer was? The answer was where you can get the permit from the local authority. And I think, I, we, first we said, we were, why is this? We should have higher ambitions. But I think this is really, really fantastic. I, I strongly agree with that, uh, with that answer. So cage aquaculture is sustainable aquaculture today. But we need also to do better tomorrow. But jointly then we need to discuss and find out what are we uh, willing to allow our authorities to permit that. And then the last, the ethical production. And here for myself, I had the greatest difficulties with what is going on whenever, when we have animals. Because we know that when we see 50,000 pigs in somewhere or 3,000 cows and so on, there will be difficulties. And that's so obvious, I think, for everyone. My best word that I've heard ever was one of my colleagues and friends in the project here, Nair Fisk. She is from Östergötland, and she said to me, you know, my brother has Östergötland's third largest cow stock, 1,300 cows. But I don't understand him, because my father told me, a man cannot have more than 65 cows. Uh -huh. Why is this? Because then he knows the name of everyone. 
isn't this deep? I think it's fantastic. Perhaps it is not where we should end, but I think we should have it in, in our mind. And then at the end here, so we need to find a system, of course. We have the, this economic system. We need to make profit out of what we do. At least we need to get the black line at the, the last line. And then we have added something here that I think that we should all think about. Meaningful occupation. Meaningful occupation. Because we, we, I have been to these things where you clean fish. And I must say, I, mean, I hope I'm not a nasty person when I'm saying this. But if I would have to say and clean fish eight hours a day the whole year round, I'm not sure that I would like to be there too long. So these things, what type of works do we want to create? And this is so inherently connected to whether we would like to have very, very big systems or whether we would like to have other systems so that we could find the right types and interesting uh, ways of working. Uh, what is important here to say also about the urban food is that it is not that it should replace what is there. The large-scale global food production, I'm sure it will be there. It also has fantastic components in that it can level out different types of weather and climate changes and, and, and so on. But we, we strongly feel that uh, where in the cities where we have the population where we need to create eco-cycles that are much more developed than today. So this urban food concept, it has a, a, a very interesting future. And the first three areas we would like to work with, that is aquaculture in recirculating production system, more or less closed system. That is horticulture production system, and that's feed from rest product steam streams. And then the very interesting thing is that this part is quite well, I would say, developed today. The combination of aquaculture and horticulture is not so well uh, developed, but it, it is there. So in more or less, we could start tomorrow and get it uh, to work. And the real challenge that I hope Anders will talk more about, that is feed from rest product uh, streams. Then here we can see uh, a system that is uh, inspired from uh, the Katastrand eco cycle station in Hanusand, where you have a fish uh, aquaculture system here to the left, and then it's combined in a greenhouse with cultivation beds. Uh, for normally it is tomatoes, but it could of course be other things. And then you have also for sludge water, you can have cultivation outside of the greenhouse. Then the economy of scale dilemma that I would like to say a few words on. And that is exemplified here, where we can see the economy of the Ras Juströ. And this is if, if you want to look later in detail to try to find out how we did this. So, but look here that the, the cost of production, that here is actually, if we should use this type of calculation for a new investment, it is four times higher actually than we can get out if we take it for, for uh, uh, five tons per year only. If we go to 200 tons, we are in balance. And then if we go up to 1,000 tons, we make a real profit per year. And this is then, we should mention that this is pike perch in Stockholm 2050. So this is a rather high price for a fish if you compare it with the world market price. But you have to do these types of calculations. And then I would say that a first conclusion, that is, of course, that this economy of scale, it tells that I should not even bother if I cannot have the money to build something that is two, uh, three, four hundred tons or larger. And that's why people today go ahead and they buy uh, or they construct plants for two thousand or three uh, thousand tons per day. But I think it's worth it. Is it should it be that easy or to, to simply go that way? And I would like just to raise that as a question. And then first, I will, to conclude, I will take a, and mention what I would regard as a few of the first-hand challenges, those that are immediate in this area. And that the cost of production that we have in Sweden, it has to be balanced so that it also we consider the externalities that are not paid in other countries when we import the fish. If we have, compete and we buy buying fish where they pay the workers one-tenth of what we pay in Sweden, and where the environmental uh, so regulations are not that strict. Why should we buy that fish and then go and ask our producer 
to uh, install uh, very heavy equipment or to do things that we have very strong regulations in Sweden. It's not fair competition and it will not work. <coughs> Cultivation control or monitoring. That is very interesting. And here, the Justeria plant, I would say, is in many ways world leading. You can see there are about 20 different cameras so that you can online, you can follow oxygen concentrations, you can follow carbon dioxide, concentration, temperature, pH, and so on. And you have this so that you can be in Switzerland or in Holland or wherever, and you can see the fish swim around with the cameras in, in the fish basins. And that is a tremendous improvement because the uh, labor cost is uh, one of the real important ones in our uh, Swedish economy. Energy use, there, uh, there much will be done stepwise to go lower. The plant adjuster is not so efficient because there are very high pumping heights, so it was a standard uh, construction in 2008 or so. There can be much more done there. Competence development and education of to-be fish farmers. We actually need to start educate people that should take care of this because, I mean, it is something that you need to learn as a, a, a career. And then capital supply until existing systems for production and distribution are better proven. So there is still a, a lack of, of money in order to get big plants to, to, to get started. Then I've called also a couple of secondhand challenges that I think are important. And they are deeper. And then is how may organic rest products from urban areas, food waste, organic uh, industrial waste, and also not the least toilet waste, how are we going to create recirculating systems for them? Because these systems, they are not very well operating today, even if we are the best in the world in relative terms. So if we really put it against sustainability demands, I would argue that we need to take care of this should much more be uh, regarded as a resource and recycled back into agriculture than we do today. And how do we now organize this so we can go and use it in our food system without harming or spreading diseases? A second, how will it be possible to live up to high ethical standard in fish production when economy of scale is so strong? This is such a strong pulling force. So we are, I would say, we are tempted to go for that money and then the, uh, lower our th uh, thoughts of the animals. And then, how then will it be possible to create profitable small-scale circular food production systems generating meaningful occupation? So then the last question here to you, that is, what will this she eat? This picture, I was happy when I told you, this picture is taken Saturday in the Shiro Miro Museum in Palma, Mallorca. So it's only two days old picture, but I love the structure of, of, of it. And what will we eat? So this is my contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone have any questions? Yes. You have a chance. Always have questions. <laughs> this is a vegetarian fish, right? So your fish are carnivores. Mm. Uh, what about the uh, ethical aspects of the uh, food that uh, the fish pellets, or, or how are you thinking uh, 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 around uh, what to feed your fish with? Yeah, I think that is part of what uh, I think is a very interesting shaping of this uh, afternoon, because I think that uh, under Kisling here will talk a, a lot about that. We can say that where I am personally now, I can, I'm, I'm convinced that we can say that with traditional uh, food pellets, so to say, for both carnivores or other types of fish, we can now start to build uh, production size plants for the fish aquaculture and for the combined uh, horticulture. We have not yet been able to, to produce, I mean, the, the, the feed in the way we want. So that is the next big challenge in these more closed systems. Uh, when you talk about this, just that is yes. That is yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I am working with another type of fish, which is a tropical fish called tilapia or Uh 
that is actually easier to, to farm because of lower oxygen demand. And we also have clarias, catfish, for instance. So there is other species that can be used and are used in the worldwide market. Mm -hmm. And it can be used in Sweden. Uh, how do you see that, that we can grow tropical fish in, in, uh, in Sweden? I'm sure we will do it. And uh, we have close contacts with uh, uh, a, a company in Skåne, in Tollarp, the Scandinavian Aqua Systems. And they are working in a similar size plant as Justerö and with tilapia. And there, there are others as well. Uh, we can also mention that in the Justerö plant we have also cultivated uh, perch and we are cultivated now uh, this um, rainbow trout. So the, there can be many, and uh, why not in the future that you can have several species in the same plant? And you had a little water change. How much is it a day or a month? Oh, it is uh, in this specific case, uh, if you see how much water is turned around per day in this loop and how much is added. So it's 0.3% that is added per day. And in, uh, in total, in this 100 cubic meter total volume system, so we are eight, uh, adding eight to 10 cubic meters per day. Uh, regarding that, I think we should talk about how much water are we letting out of the system not putting into the system, because that depends on climate, uh, temperature, and so on. So it is actually possible today to have an aquaculture system where you have zero emissions from mm. it. We have been running it for three years. Yes. I agree, so that's some. No gap for your vlogger. There is one up there, I think. Oh, over there. Yes, it's a very interesting fish you have made. But we have to remember one uh, thing. The rod is round and it's all. In that case, already restricted. And you can't really grow the population. It will grow exponentially. Basically, we can perhaps do 50 million by new technique, but we have to be under, understand that we and climate are coupled, we are really technical uh, ways to get energy from the sun, but as I already said, the population is, we can't grow it too much, and then we have We have also think about the right to plants, the right to human, and the right to the animals, and how we shall make an ethic thing for the whole living. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about this? I cannot more than uh, agree to what I think your, your general comment is. Uh, uh, my comment to that is, is that I'm not trying with this to, say, to uh, so say, uh, save the world. Not, not at all. I'm, I'm trying to convince uh, you here that we should have uh, more fish on uh, our plates. No more questions? Nej, då är det dags att tacka Björn. Tack så mycket, tack, tack.